Every bitch got a choice in this game. I'm watching a lot of the dance sequence. I'm a guy. And on the one hand, I don't know that I'm be objectifying them necessarily. I mean, I think there's, I think there's a fine line that you have to kind of juggle. And the fine line is, how do we do this where they're not being objectified, but also we don't want to make them unsexy. Like, I mean, there's empowerment in the sexiness of what they do. How do you straddle that? Like, uh, what are the conversations that go into presenting that visually? Well, it first started with with the understanding that there there has been a longstanding misrepresentation of of this particular group of women, and also a hypersexualization of Black women. Period. And so, um, the conversations that went into how to explore empowerment in the space of of um, exploitation uh, were not shying away from the truth nor the nudity but um, very much working to not objectify these women. That started um, with how Katori captured the story in her writing. It was so liberating for me uh, to read the pilot for the very first time because she captured that empowerment um, in the story. And so it was very important um, for me to, to lead with that same um, truth uh, as I shot these these characters and these women. And, and, and I think I can root that um, in the female gaze and being able to, uh, to, to lens the show through a female gaze. But so then like, okay, so then let's get into this trajectory. You're interning with Director X, you become this music video director. The reason now I was talking about aesthetic, right, is we talk about aesthetics, like, and this transition of music video directors into hit, into filmmaking right um and when we talk about that on a hip hop in hip hop terms i feel like i feel like the the music video directors that make the transition from hip hop to narrative filmmaking don't get the benefit of the doubt so to speak like if you think about like how david fincher can go from directing madonna's vogue to then becoming one of the great filmmakers think about paul thomas anderson who you know goes back and forth but then you think about hype williams like his aesthetic when that transfers over into belly uh, or f gary gray there's very few success stories in that sense from directing hip-hop story videos music videos to narrative filmmaking um have you noticed that have you noticed the kind of like like the, it's like or at least in the past historically that that's been a challenge for hip-hop directors but maybe that's changing now yeah, I mean, first of all, life does not progress and humanity does not progress and art does not progress without um, Black culture. And I think um, it, it, it's maddening that someone like um, Hype, who is the godfather um, of, of music video, filmmaking and storytelling, um, doesn't get the same uh, respect as a David Fincher and they come from the same place that is uh, bias and that is racism um, and it is uh, I have to work um, hard to not believe that narrative within myself I have to un uh, learn that thinking that was projected onto me to be able to move through that narrative and to, to break through what people think about myself and thereby what I think about my own work and my own value. Right. Well, and I mean, so now, now this is where going back to the aesthetic thing, right? When we talk when I, so, cause I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty of looking at belly and be like, Oh, he directed it like a music video. I'm guilty of looking now at the first episode of P Valley. It's like, Oh, it looks kind of like one of our music videos. And it's like, mm -hmm. so we immediately, say that this, we, we limit that aesthetic to being of an aesthetic of uh, a, a music video aesthetic, whereas we don't do that with other filmmakers when they bring their aesthetic to films, right? So is there a hip hop yeah. aesthetic that can, be, that belongs just, that has every right to be in narrative storytelling as it does in like, you know, as other aesthetics do in that field? Well, I mean, P-Valley is a really good example. Katori wanted to explore how um, the language of music video can um, merge into the language of narrative. And we were exploring how the two merge and how one lives in the other. 
and could live with the other and not without it and not hinder the other. Um, so this the style of the show very much moves from this kind of uh, music video-esque uh, aesthetic and uh, has that kind of like lyricism and rhythm that music videos carry um, in the narrative and uh, it flows from one to the other and with the other. Speaking to the vessel thing, like, you know, like you're there to reach people's visions and stuff like, uh, and I've heard you say that before. I heard you say that when you're doing a music video, you're there to, you know, you're, you're looking at who you're making this music video for and you're making it, you're, you're, you're translating their voice. Well, then I, I want to know, like looking at, looking at your entire trajectory, all your work, what is the work that is most personal to you out of that stuff? Like, what is the one that screams, I am Karina Evans? Um, everything that I do, I feel is personal. I, I don't like to um, take on anything that I can't offer my perspective on uh, because I feel in that regard, I don't have really any business directing it if I can't uh, identify a personal connection to it. And so I, I, I like to, um, even despite telling somebody else's story, find the personal um, connection to it. Uh, but to answer your question, question, which is what do I find out of all my work is the most, Karina? Yeah. Uh, wow. I've never thought about this or had to answer this question. That's okay. I, I'm, I'm enjoying watching you think about it. So take your time. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> it's like... Um... I I would say that um, God's plan and uh, in my feelings and um, uh, everyday life, which I did for Coldplay, are um, closely linked to my heart. I think that each of those um, in, in their respective way uh, have impacted culture and have impacted people and, and have um, been able to, uh, even in some small way, strike hope in people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's the reason why I tell stories. It's, it's to move people. And I feel like those um, were, to whatever degree, successful in um, moving people because they came from a place of, of love and, um, and, and purity and honesty. Okay, awesome. Um, so then now tell me, where do you go from here? The, like you said, you mentioned, what was the other show you directed an episode for? Snowfall. I just did an episode of Snowfall. Um, where do I go from here? Films. Yeah. I focused on um, my first feature and the features to come. I uh, am really excited about that next venture. What can you tell me about? Are, wait, are you going to make that in Canada and the U.S.? Is there like, is there like telefilm stuff happening here? What's going on? I cannot tell you. <laughs> you can't tell me anything. Okay. Unfortunately, but the focus right now are my films. You know, but it's landing right in my. I'm at my first job is film critic, so that is coming. You're coming right down into like my <laughs> so area. We will return back to the <laughs> conversation back in okay. a year. I will sit down with you and we will talk about the film. Yeah, yeah. Without this COVID business. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We'll do it for real. Circle up. Come on. Tonight. We gon' stack that scribbler!